Hey guys, welcome back to Tiny Fibre Studio. This is episode 10 of a podcast about knitting, spinning, and specifically about me trying to become a more purposeful spinner by only knitting with my own hand spun in 2017. For those of you who are returning viewers, thank you so much for sticking with me through my little absence for most of uh, March and April. For those of you who are new, welcome. Thank you very much for checking out this podcast and I hope you find it useful and enjoyable. So I have been kind of AWOL for a couple of weeks, um, partly because of changing roles at work, um, which is a, a very positive thing, but it's just kind of taken a lot of my time and attention. Also because my upstairs neighbours have been off sick, or at least the female of the couple has been off sick, and their dog has been running around really enjoying their attention, which unfortunately means that that's all I hear on my ceiling. <laughs> um, so it makes it very, very difficult to record a podcast without getting all the dog noise in. So apologies for that. Um, I'm really, really sorry that it's taken so long to get another episode out. Um, there was also a point where I was I had a chance to record a podcast and I didn't just because I didn't really feel like I'd got very much done in between that and the previous episode. So anyway, I'm back. Um, I hope you're all doing well. I hope your spinning and knitting is progressing well. Um, I have some finished objects to show you. Look, it's done. It's finished, finally. I say finished, there's a couple of ends to weave in, but I'm kind of hiding those back there right now. Um, so <laughs> this is a Loon Moor by Isolde Teague. Everybody is probably sick of me saying this because I've been knitting this since January. Technically, I've knitted it twice because the first time it was too long and I decided that I wasn't just going to put up with something that wasn't quite perfect. Um, so I re-knitted it. It was equally as enjoyable the second time around. Um, I did have to go back and kind of pick up some stitch pattern where I'd not been concentrating and I purled where I should have knitted or vice versa. Uh, I used the new stitch fixer tool that I got at Edinburgh Yarn Festival. Um, worked really well and really easily. So much easier picking up a mixture of knits and purls in a, a column than just using a normal crochet hook. So that made it go really fast. And I think it's now the perfect size. Um, there's still a little bit of room where it, it could grow a little bit if it wants to, but I think this is a good size for me. I took two full repeats out of the stitch pattern um, and that was what got it down to a good size for me. So yeah, I'm really happy with that. Hand spun and knitted as my uh, second project, technically of hand spun 17, but the only one that's been done from start to finish in that time span. So that's really cool. I'm very happy to have it finished. Of course, as soon as I finished it, the weather started warming up. So this probably won't get very much wear <laughs> at this point in the year. Who knows? British weather is kind of all over the place so who knows it might go cold again and I might have a reason to bring it out and show it off but yeah very happy with it and also very happy to now move on to something else so speaking of moving on to something else finished hand spins I finished the third attempt at black stroke very 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 dark brown um Shetland. I talked about this in the last episode. I've been having real problems trying to get black Shetland that doesn't turn out really kempy and I'd had two attempts, one of which was kempy from the start. As soon as I started processing it I could tell that it was there was just kemp everywhere. Um, this is the one from Jameson and Smith. It's better it's still got a little bit of Kemp, but I think it's the best that I'm going to get and I'm not going to drive myself crazy doing more and more and more Black Shetland because I don't think I'm going to get a better result than I have here. So I'm just going to roll with that and that is going to become part of my pixelated pullover slash blank canvas mashup. So it's going to go with this 
and these two into a little gradient. So it's going to be a gradient in the pixelated pullover and I'm pretty happy with this. This was spun, where are we, two, possibly three years after these <laughs> and not on the same wheel. So I'm fairly happy with how I managed to match it up. It's not absolutely there, but it's close enough. I think it'll work. I'm going to do a swatch um, as soon as I finish recording this episode. I'm going to start swatching with these to see how they pan out. But I think they're going to be okay. So finished. That will start to become pixelated pullover immediately after this episode. And my other finished spin, which I'm super happy with and I had a lot of fun with was the Five Shades of Grey sample pack from World of Wool. So this is part of their Carded Sliver Corydale range and they're going to be bringing out some solid colours. At the moment they do some really nice heathered colours. I showed you the green version last time. They're going to be bringing out some solid colours later on this year which I'm very excited about because this was so much fun and so easy and so quick to spin. I think one of these skeins took me less than an hour from start to finish, two plied. Um, I think one of the three plies only took me slightly longer than that. Loads of fun. I had lots of comments on Instagram when I posted a picture of them saying things like, you know, how did you prep it for a uh, long draw? And the fact is, I didn't. Because Sliver is a carded preparation, it's pretty much ready to spin. I will say that some of these came as kind of like a top format, so like a continuous rope. And a couple of them came in kind of a cloud, sort of an and a disorganised bat. <laughs> um, I don't know whether that's going to be indicative of the rest of the range. May just have been a fluke, I don't know. Um, I do know that the green that I have is a continuous rope, but just be aware it's possible that you might have some that comes out as a cloud. If you do, I literally just kind of spun it from that cloud. It was straightforward enough. But the spinning of these is really, really easy because they're carded preparation already. So literally all you have to do is put some twist in there. And I just did mostly unsupported long draw for it. I did a few of these a two ply, a few a three ply. I just wanted to kind of see how they would come out. And they're really, really nice and soft and squishy and smushy and have tons of air in them. I found it really easy and I'm very tempted to get a sweater's worth <laughs> because I can really see a few sweaters that would be amazing in this. Definitely a really good idea to check it out if you don't have any fibre preparation tools or maybe you just have hand carders and like me you're not terribly good at hand carding. But certainly if you don't have a drum carder and you're a little bit intimidated by doing large amounts of carded um, preparation and long draw, I would definitely check this out. As I say, currently they're in the Five Shades of Grey. There are some coloured versions as well, which are like a mild colour. And they also have a kind of warm neutrals um, named after woodland animals, which is really cute. Um, and I love the product photos that they have on their website as well. Super cute. They've got little animal faces that they've cut out and stuck on them. <laughs> I did email World of Wool about them because I just wanted to find out how long they'd been on the website because I didn't remember seeing Carded Sliver on there before. And they did confirm that it had only been on the website since they revamped their website, which I think was 
beginning of I want to say beginning of March possibly beginning of February but certainly they haven't been around for very long um, highly recommended I had loads of fun spinning these and I'm going to swatch them just to see how they kind of work up together and I will also be using this as my um, my palette for deciding which of these greys gets to become a sweater. You tell me what you think as well, because I really love, I think particularly these two, but you tell me what you think. So those are my finished spins. I also have a spin in progress as well. As you can see, there's nothing on the um, the mini spinner at the moment. But I did have something on my matchless, which I'll be honest, I started spinning probably a good year ago and it hasn't been finished yet, which was I had these rather fabulous greens already done. And... I had this on the wheel. So the intention is they're both um, intended to be two ply lace weight. So the intention is for them to go together in some sort of striped lace weight pattern. Because it's been such a long time since I spun these, the settings on the wheel will have changed. The drive band will have stretched and so on. But I think I'm pretty close. I had a sample attached to the wheel to kind of go back and comp compare it to the only issue is that these singles will have obviously lost twist while they've been sitting there so um, either I'm going to have to revive the twist a little bit or I'm just going to have to go by what I two ply sampled um, where I did the ply back test have to go along with something along those lines so there is a bobbin of this still to go um, I'm spinning this on double drive on the matchless, which I really like for kind of long-term production projects because you don't really have to adjust the tension or anything. You just kind of set it and it's pretty much good to go. In case you're wondering, these are bobbins up storage bobbins, which I bought a couple of years ago because frankly, shacked bobbins, especially in the UK, are kind of ridiculously expensive and don't flat pack like Acoworks ones do. And I just wanted something that was gonna be a cheap but good option. The nice thing with bobbins up is that they come with a drill bit attachment <laughs> so that you can actually put the drill bit on the end there and then you can use your drill to wind your bobbins, which is very cool. So that's what I've done with those. And yeah, looking forward to getting this finished. So this is Merino from uh, Wingham's. I visited Wingham's when I first bought my Ashford Joy. That was where I got it from. And I think I purchased this at the same time. So the fiber's pretty old now, but I'm looking forward to getting that all finished and starting to think about what I might make from that. It's good to get something off the wheel that's been kind of sitting on there for a long time. <laughs> Speaking of the matchless, I did mention a couple of episodes ago that I had recorded a segment about the matchless and how it works and my acquisition of the matchless. So here we go. Here is my introduction to my shack matchless wheel. So welcome to wheel number two in my collection. This of course is the Shack Matchless and this was my second wheel. I had my Ashford Joy and I was, I was happy enough with it. I was getting on okay, but I wanted something that had more options. It was very difficult to find anywhere to be able to test drive Shacked wheels at the time because in the UK there was only one supplier. They were up in the middle of nowhere in Cumbria, I think. And it was just impossible for me to actually get there to try it out. So when I was working over in California for a few months of 2012, I went into a shop called uh, Perlescence in Sunnyvale and they had all of the shacked range available to try out. 
and I was I was very upfront about it. I said, look, you know, I'm here for working for a little while from the UK. I'm not going to be able to buy a spinning wheel and ship it back, but it's really hard for me to find anywhere in the UK to be able to test these out. So would it be okay if I gave them a test drive? And they said, yeah, absolutely. Here's some fiber, go ahead. Um, I did buy some stuff from them as well. It wasn't like I just went in for total freebies. But the one that I was actually interested in at the time was the Schacht Ladybug, which is the one with the red drive wheel. So I was primarily interested in trying that one out. And I tried that and it was great. I loved it. And when I'd finished spinning on that one, the uh, the lady who was running the shop said, do you want to try the matchless? She knew she wasn't going to get a sale from it. So it wasn't a question of kind of pushing me towards that one. But I went, you know, go on then. Okay, fine. And I tried it and it was... It was amazing. It was like spinning with butter, so smooth. And from that point on, this was the one that I was going to get. And I was so sure that I was going to get one that when I went to a verb for keeping warm in Oakland, I actually picked up two high speed bobbins <laughs> and an extra whirl because I knew I was going to get one of these. However, when I got back to Manchester, Plans kind of changed because I had to move house and lots of other stuff. So getting the matchless got put on the back burner for a long time. And I managed to acquire it entirely by chance by this amazing, miraculous twist of fate. So the twist of fate happened when my family and I were on holiday in the Lake District. And we went to this fabulous little shop that's community run. And the lady who was looking after it that day was spinning on a Spinolution B, which I hadn't known anybody before who had one of those. I'd come across them, I'd seen them before, but I just didn't know anybody with first-hand experience. So we got chatting and, you know, the obvious question came up, which was, you know, which wheel do you have? And I said, well, you know, at the moment I have an Ash for Joy, but one of these days I would really like to get a Shack Matchless. And... She went, oh, I've got a friend who might be selling theirs. Brilliant, hook me up. <laughs> so she gave me this lady's Ravelry username and I got in touch. This was the last day of our holiday. I got in touch and I said, hey, I heard that you might be selling your Shack Matchless. Is that the case? If so, how much and where are you? Expecting her to say that she was somewhere in the Lake District. She came back to me with a price that you could not possibly turn down. It was a complete bargain. And she was actually on a canal boat, pretty close to our route back to the southwest of England the next day. So I spoke very nicely to my mum and stepdad and said, please, 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 can we stop off? at this canal boat and pick up this spinning wheel tomorrow because I can't, I can't let that go. It's a ridiculously cheap price and I have to have it. So we did, we went and picked it up. It got strapped into the back seat and off we trundled back to the Southwest with me, with my beautiful new Shack Matchless. So the Shack Matchless is a very versatile wheel, which is one of the reasons why I wanted one. It has loads of different whirls, so you can get a massive range of ratios just by getting the extra whirls for it. Um, one of the whirls is actually stored back here. Um, that's permanently stored there, and I have a little collection of other whirls as well. You can get the bulky flyer for it. I just have the standard one because I don't really spin a lot of bulky. And perhaps most importantly, it has the different drive systems. So it can be scotch tension. Mine's actually set up as double drive right now, but it can be scotch tension. because so I've got the scotch tension cord right there. And you can set it up an Irish drive as well, or bobbin lead. So the thing that I like about double drive is that generally once you have double drive set up, you don't need to do very much adjustment. Whereas when you're doing scotch tension, normally, 
you have to change the scotch tension as you go through, as the bobbin fills up, to keep the same amount of drawing in and the same amount of twist per draft, I guess. So that's one of the things that I like about using it in double drive and it's probably been set up in double drive for about the last two years or so. It's a beautifully made wheel. Um, the reason that it was so cheap was that they did have a batch of wheels that needed to go back to Schacht for some wheel repairs. The actual drive wheel was splitting because of some issue to do with the way that wood behaves when it gets either slightly more humidity or slightly less humidity. And so there were cracks appearing, not in the wood itself, but just in between the joins. Uh, so that was why it was so cheap and the lady the lady who'd bought it bought it cheap for that reason and she was getting rid of it because it was too big to go on her canal boat. I'm not quite sure that if I was living on a narrow boat that I would necessarily pick the shack mattress as my first choice of wheel. <laughs> um, I suspect since then she's probably got something quite a bit smaller. Um, but I, I just love the fact that I got onto yeah. this narrow boat and there was this massive wheel <laughs> that was kind of taking up most of the space in the, the sort of lounge bit of the cabin. Um, it's kind of crazy, but I love her for, um, for not taking advantage and hiking the price up. She bought it cheaply, she passed it on to me cheaply. So, totally love this wheel. Um... It served me very, very well, and it's a wheel that I would be very reluctant to get rid of because it came to me in such a sort of fortuitous way that I sort of feel like it was meant to be. It does take up quite a lot of space, but it's a beautifully made wheel, it's very versatile, produces beautiful yarn. I've actually, I'm part way through spinning some lace weight on this at the moment um, which to be honest hasn't been touched for a little while but it will get done and I also really like the details of the the little bits of um, walnuts in here as well just makes it a little bit more fancy and I like that so yeah Shat Matchless absolute thumbs up I do recommend it. As with any wheel, I would always recommend testing it out before you go ahead and buy one. But it is worth it. Um, it's quite expensive to buy new and they don't come up secondhand very often. So if you see one secondhand that's in good condition, then I would probably jump at the chance. It comes with two flyer whirls, these bits. One is fast and one is medium. And then there are four additional whirls that you can get as well, which in total give you the option of ratios anything from four to one all the way up to 21 to one. So it can go pretty fast if you need it to. And I like the fact that there are all those different variations. Each whirl has uh, two grooves. So, each whirl has two ratio options in it. In terms of the spinning position, I definitely find this really comfortable to spin on, but as with anything else, I would highly recommend that you try it out before you buy, just because the ergonomics that I have with this wheel might be different from your ergonomics with it. So definitely give it a go, but I find the orifice to be at a really nice height for me. Again, if you imagine that I'm sitting on the sofa, the orifice height is probably around sort of here or so on me. So test it out beforehand, but the Shack Matchless is definitely a wheel that I enjoy spinning on and for me is very practical and this will probably be space permitting a lifetime wheel for me. So there you go, that is the Shack Matchless. Next up in the next episode will be the Shack Sidekick which is the third of my manual wheels. And then it's really just this one to talk about. 
I've already talked about this one a fair bit, but I will do a little introduction to how I acquired my uh, mini spinner. So next up in my events calendar should be Wonderwall. I say should be because I'm kind of thinking right now that I'm not going to be going. There's some stuff that's come up that clashes with the day that I was going to go to Wonderwall. There's actually two other events, um, totally non-spinning related things that I kind of feel like I should be at, at least one of them. So there's that and there's also the fact that at some point in the next few months, four months maybe, I need to start thinking about buying a house. So I'm just entering my phase of having to be really careful with my money so that when I go to see a mortgage advisor, they don't have any questions about the affordability of a mortgage. I would absolutely be able to afford a mortgage. The mortgage payments would be roughly about the same as my rent is now. So affordability is not actually an issue, but you just want to make sure that you kind of show some restraint in your spending before you actually go and apply for a mortgage because they're going to go through your bank statements with a fine tooth comb and go, what's this £130 that you spent in Wales? Well, (laughs) um, I also don't really think that I need anything and I know we generally tend to still go to events even if we don't need anything but I don't really want to move with even more stuff than I have right now. I have too much stuff as it is so I'm thinking I probably won't be going. Wonderwall wouldn't be as much of a social occasion for me as Edinburgh was so I don't feel like I'm going to be hugely missing out by not going. I have plenty of fibre, I have plenty of fibre tools, I really don't need anything and if I need to start to restrict my spending a little bit this is really one of those areas that I need to kind of cut back on. So my thinking right now is that I'm not going to be going to Wonderwall, haven't made that final decision yet although I will be letting Devon Guild know by Sunday if I'm not going on their coach. And so finally, um, what else has been going on in my life? I'm not entirely sure that anybody else cares, so (laughs) I'll keep this short. But um, I have recovered from the foot injury that I had at the beginning of the year, which according to my doctor was some kind of trauma injury to the top of my foot. I still can't think of anything that would have done that, but hey-ho, that was what he said. Uh, So I've given it plenty of rest. I switched over into normal um, shoes, well, hiking shoes, because that's pretty much the only normal shoes that I have now. Normally, I wear these things called five fingers, which are very minimalist shoes with like pockets for each toe, so that each toe is able to completely move independently. And I wear those all the time for everything. I started wearing them for running and then I just started wearing them for everything from about 2012 onwards. And because I'm now back in normal shoes, I've been able to start running again, which has been really nice. The weather here has been really, really good for the Easter break. And it's really made me want to go out and run which I haven't really felt the urge to do for a long time. So I've been going out and running uh, about three miles, three times a week. I think tomorrow I'm going to try and do the local park run. Um, It's not really close to me. There's a massive park in the middle of the town where I live, which would be perfect for a park run, but I'm not quite sure why they don't have one. So the one that I'm going to is going to involve probably getting up very early, either running or cycling to a ferry, like a a foot slash bike ferry, um, ending up over in Cornwall and then doing part run over there and heading back again on the ferry. So (laughs) we'll see. We'll see if that happens. It will very much depend on how I feel when I wake up tomorrow morning. Um, hopefully I can shift my bum out of bed and go and do a park run because I haven't done one of those in a really long time either. 
And I kind of feel like I should point out that I am not a sporty person. At school, I was very definitely not in the sporty kids group. I think sport at school can be really divisive. Certainly in my school, it was really divisive because there was the sporty kids group and the non-sporty kids slash alternative group. And it doesn't have to be like that. And I just wish that when I was at school, I'd been given the tools to be able to build up my exercise in a structured way. Um, I wasn't, I kind of feel a little bit cheated by the school system for the fact that they didn't teach me that. But I figured it out eventually on my own. I used couch to 5k initially to get into running, uh, which was about nine years ago now. And I've since run 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons and one full marathon. I'm considering doing another half marathon later on in the year. So stay tuned to see whether that goes ahead. (laughs) So there you go. That's some of the stuff that's been happening in my life over the last couple of weeks. Um, If you don't care, it's totally fine to say you don't care. Let me know. Let me know if you want to hear a little tiny bit of what's been going on the rest of my life in the podcast. If not, I won't take offence. I'll just not talk about it. So that's it for another episode of Tiny Fibre Studio. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I hope all of the information in this has been useful. If it has, then feel free to hit the subscribe button so that you get notified about future episodes. Also, give me a little thumbs up to let me know that you enjoyed it. In between now and the next episode, you can find me on Instagram as Tiny Fibre Studio. On Ravelry, I'm Ibex. And there's also the Tiny Fibre Studio group on Ravelry as well. So check in there to get in touch with other viewers of the podcast. You can also leave me a comment on YouTube. I do try to check into those pretty regularly and, and give everybody a response. So that's a really good place to try and get in touch with me. So in between now and the next episode, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.